In this lecture, I'm going to take you through the sociology of punishment, which links in with our previous lecture on the role of the criminal justice system. So in this lecture, I'm going to go through the different purposes of punishment as set out by Newburn, and then talk about different perspectives, views on punishment, and then how punishment change it has changed over time, and finally focus in on prisons and the effectiveness of prisons as a punishment system. So as ever, you need to take your own notes however you choose to, and then alongside the crime uh, criminal justice system lecture, complete the notes grid highlighting to show your levels of confidence with each question. So let's start with this idea of what, why do we punish? What, what is the purpose of punishments? And we're not talking about informal social control here. We're not talking about things that your parents might do, grounding you, um, a smack across the back of the legs, which you're not really supposed to do anymore, um, or things like that, taking away your, po your pocket money. We're talking about this on a macro level. So we're looking at it from a societal viewpoint. So Newburn identifies five purposes of punishment for society. The reason why we punish people who break the law and break the norms and values of our society. The first one he talks about is rehabilitation and deterrence. So what he's saying here is that they're not just trying to stop people from offending in the first place with deterrence. Don't do this, this thing because this is what the punishment will be. He's also talking about when people do commit a crime, about helping them not to do it again. And that might be um, understanding why what they did was wrong. It might be dealing with more structural and societal level um, causes that led to them to commit the crime in the first place. But it's about preventing crime. So the punishment is a form of rehabilitation, but it's also a form of deterrence to stop people doing things in the first place. He also talks about restorative justice, and this is about forcing um, criminals to make amends for to the victims that they have harmed. And that might be spending time incarcerated. It might be financial restorative justice. It might be an apology um, for what they've done and showing remorse for what they've done. But it's about getting the criminal to um, understand that what they've done is wrong and try and make amends for that. Try and try and build bridges, if you like, in terms of um, I can't remember what I was going to say there. Anyway, um, <laughs> protection of society. So this is in particular um, to do with things like incarceration, but it's about make, taking offenders out of society for the protection of society. So taking or identifying those people who are a danger to society. So we're not just talking about um, petty crimes, we're really talking about the um, more serious crimes here, but it's about taking the people who commit these crimes and act in a way that is considered a danger to society as a whole and removing them from society. And the main way we do this is through incarceration and sending people to prison. Now, in the US, they also have the death penalty, which is seen as a form of protection for society. We don't have that in the UK. There is no crime in the UK that is still that allows for the death penalty, not even treason anymore. Um, but the removal of these these offenders from society to make it so that they can no longer harm others. They are no longer danger, a danger to society. Boundary maintenance. So we've talked about this before when we talked about um, theories of crime and deviance and the functionalist theory of crime and deviance. But the idea of punishment is to remind people of what is and is not acceptable behaviour. So it used to be that um, punishments, court cases, particularly magistrates courts, would publish their um, judgments in the local newspaper and you could read it. 
and my grandmother did regularly every Friday she'd sit down and read what were the judgments for that week I think she was actually just trying to be nosy but um and see if there was anyone she knew <laughs> but and I don't know if they do it anymore but it used to be that this was a way and and just through the general news media and mainstream media the identification of this is what could happen to you if you do this as well if you um commit this crime if you engage in this activity if you engage in this behavior this is what could happen to you so it's reminding people that what is and is not acceptable behavior and what they could what punishments they could incur should they decide to engage in that behavior and the final one is about retribution so um in this case it's about almost like just desserts um in the sense of criminals deserve to be punished for their crimes they've done something bad and there are consequences for your actions so they deserve the punishment they've got because they are reaping the um what they sow to use another analogy but they 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 they've done this and there are consequences for your behavior and punishments are the consequence when you act in a way that is criminal or deviant so for um newburn he he kind of created the or, or brought together these ideas of what the purpose of punishment is and he also pointed out that f for different people within the criminal justice system within the the the, that were involved in the criminal act itself they're going to have different purposes to the punishment so for example a victim might want retribution um and restorative justice they, they want an apology and they want the, the criminal to be punished whereas the um criminal justice system may be more about rehabilitation um the government might be more about boundary maintenance so depending on who you are within the system within the um scenario you're going to have different views as to what the purpose of the punishment is for that crime or deviant behavior so when we move on then to look at the perspectives on punishment what we're looking at here is what um, sociologists believe the the role of punishment is in society so we're looking at why punishment exists and what purpose does it have in society so we'll start with the functionalists and Durkheim in particular suggests that um, society can only exist if there is a shared system of values that tie everybody together that create a um, morally and um value based agreement as to how people should live their lives otherwise it would be anime and chaos and society would collapse so for durkheim he suggests that um the law represents a collective consciousness the laws are a way of codifying the norms and values the morals of a society to remind people of this is how we we live this is how we exist within our society so punishment is about reinforcing that collective consciousness it's about creating reminders the boundary maintenance um, of what can happen if you engage in criminal activity or deviant behavior and Durkheim actually says that the retribution side of um, punishment gives people an outlet for the anger that they feel when crime has occurred that some and um, when somebody can't abide by the rules of the society as well as reaffirming the collective conscious so again for the functionalists as always they're looking at the positives of punishment they're looking at sit looking at punishment and kind of saying this is what it does to benefit society creating that collective consciousness reinforcing that collective consciousness and giving people a an outlet for the anger they might feel at being a victim or at 
the issue, the, the crime that has been occurred. And as you can imagine, the Marxists are pretty much the opposite. They see um, punishment as part of a repressive state apparatus that is the criminal justice system. They see it as a way of the ruling class to um, keep people in line, to, to control the, the proletariat, because it's the bourgeoisie who are the ones who are creating the laws and they're reflecting the bourgeoisie ideology. So as we've said before, with the selective law making, the um, Marxists see punishments as a reflection of ruling class dominance. It's not about collective consciousness. It's not about keeping society together. It's about keeping the working class in their place, keeping the bourgeois, the proletariat in their place, knowing where they belong and preventing revolution. So behaviours that could lead to revolution, protests and things like that can be outlawed or they can be tightly controlled by the criminal justice system, for example, by having needing to have a licence or permissions to, to have a protest. It keeps the proletariat in their place. It keeps them under control. So rather than seeing it as a positive for society, the Marxists see punishment as punitive and negative for society because it's preventing the revolution from taking place and the rising up of the proletariat, etc. Weber, on the other hand, talks about a legal, rational authority. And he kind of comes in between the Marxists and the functionalists in that he says that only the state has the power to punish offenders. So we've moved away from local landowners and a kind of decentralized punishment system to a, a more central punishment system. And the law, the, sorry, the, the punishments are based on impersonal rules and regulations, which is which is what we mean by legal rational. It's not emotive. It's not based on emotion. Um, it's based on a um, vast bureaucracy with lots of checks and balances. So as we said in the previous lecture, when we were looking at um, the criminal justice system, when it comes to the sentencing of a criminal, the judge can't or the magistrate just can't do whatever they like. There is guidelines, there is precedent where judges will have to consider mitigating and aggravating circumstances. They will have to consider whether or not the um, defendant has been on remand for however long before the case came to court. Um, they have to take into account the victim and victim statements that are given at sentencing. So it, it's not just a case of a judge doing whatever they want. They have guidelines and all crimes in the UK do have maximum sentencing. They don't have minimum, but we do have maximum sentencing. So they can't just turn around and say um, to somebody, oh, you're, you, you've done this, so I'm going to put you in prison for the rest of your life. They do actually have to work within the guidelines. And that can be why for some people they um, have what we call con um, consecutive sentences. So in order to remove the um, offender from society, they might we have a maximum sentence of 25 years for murder. But in order to remove that person from society, maybe they, if they've murdered more than one person, they might get a life sentence for each person they've killed. Um, they might have other charges associated with the murder that then adds years onto the sentence. But the judge for the for the single sentence of murder cannot go over the 25 year sentence because that's the maximum we have. So for Weber, he says that um, punishments are a legal, rational um, authority. They are there to um, help society. Yes, they can be punitive, but they are impersonal um, regulations. They're, they are not emotive 
and there is a lot of checks and balances um, as to why people get the punishments that they get. Now we're going to look at the changing forms of punishment. So as a social phenomena, as something that occurs within society, um, it will change as the needs of society change and as society evolves. It, it kind of links back to the idea of the functional fit theory that uh, Parsons was talking about in relation to family, where the structure and roles of family change and adapt um, as society changes and, and, and evolves. So punishment has done the same thing. So we're going to look at three theories on the changing forms of fun punishment, how it's gone from one type to another. And the first one we're going to look at is Foucault. Again, I'm probably horribly mispronouncing his name, um, but I've tried to find out and there are every thing I look at gives me a different pronunciation and I can't find him saying his own name. Um, anyway, so Foucault comes at this from a postmodernist viewpoint and he argues that we have gone from a sovereign um, power where the punishments were public and they were physical because they were shows of power. Um, and this would be things like um, public hangings and floggings and the stockades where you'd have your arms and your head through the thing and people would throw rotten vegetables and stuff at you. Um, these were physical shows of power. So local landowners, nobility, gentry, mil um, monarchies would use this as a way of saying, I'm in charge. Do what I say or I will do this to you. So we're really seeing there this kind of dominance and show of power from those who um, are enacting the laws, who are in, um, enforcing the laws um, as a way of showing I am in charge, I am making the rules, you will follow my rules or I will do these sort of things to you. So I, will, I will hang you, I will flog you, I will do all of these things. Now, as the kind of sovereign power um, or society has changed to a more democratic system away from this kind of um, authoritarian system, we see a shift from sovereign power to disciplinary power. And what Foucault is talking here, and this links back to what we were talking about, about surveillance, is state power ha doesn't need to be obvious anymore. It can be more subversive. It is more subtle. Um, and it, it kind of links in with the idea of the kind of dystopian Orwellian Big Brother um, situation. Um, but in it could it is this idea that we don't need these physical shows of power anymore because our, there is so much discipline and monitoring within society um, through the use of surveillance, through the use of monitoring. So we can kind of get people almost before they commit the crime, um, although our legal system doesn't allow us to punish people for things they haven't done. Um, we only punish people for things they have done. Um, we're not quite at Minority Report just yet, but the new the way the state works now, it's not, it doesn't need those physical shows and public shows of power. That power is accepted by the, the general population, by the society, and instead they use surveillance and monitoring to to act as a way of disciplining um, their society. Next up, we've got Garland and Garland talks about the move from penal welfareism, um, which is what we states practiced in the 1950s to which. He, and this means a criminal justice system that didn't just try and catch 
and punish people, but try to rehabilitate them and reintegrate them into society. Um, very, pretty a lot of this is what we see in Scandinavian countries at the moment, where um, their, their legal system, their punishment systems are about rehabilitation and reintegration with the village prisons um, that they have. So it, within the, the Scandinavian prison system, you have your standard prisons, as, as we do. But rather than when you get to the end of your sentence, you're released and it's kind of like off you go, get on with it. They have these prison villages where you may go for the last year of your sentence or if you've got a six month sentence or something like that. And they are essentially little villages and you are monitored with an ankle monitor and there are guards and there are gates and fences and things like that. But as a as a prison, you still have you have the village shop and you have a library and you have your uh, an apartment and you're given a job and a, or a skill to develop whilst you're in prison. So that when you come out of prison, you are able to reintegrate into society. That kind of reintegrative shaming rather than disintegrative shaming that we talked about with labelling theory. And Garner argues that we've actually moved to away from this in the UK and we, we've actually gone to a more punitive state where we're in, where the government and the legal system is um, enforcing a culture of control. So the state is seeking to control crime and punish offenders through things like actuarialism, where they're identifying um, possible problem groups and putting in place interventions before they become criminal. Um, thinking things like um, the Troubled Families Programme that we talked about with uh, left realism. So controlling behaviour before it becomes criminal. He also talks about the move to mass incarceration and trans incarceration. Now, mass incarceration is pretty obvious. It's about more people in prison. Um, and we are seeing that there are more people in prison um but they're also talking about trans incarceration and what they mean by what he means by this is where individuals are locked into a cycle of carceral agencies so they, they kind of enter the criminal justice system or the, the social system early in life and they just jump from one agency to another so for example perhaps they're put into care into the care system into foster care and things like that they're, they're excluded from schools so they're going to um, people referral units or alternative provision they then end up in a youth offenders institution um, from there they might go to an offend an adult um, prison with stays in mental health facilities in between time now there, there isn't a a lot of empirical evidence to suggest that if you go into the care system you are going to become a criminal um, and there are lots of examples where that doesn't happen but there is arguments that those students who are excluded from school for whatever reason have a higher likelihood of becoming or of engaging in criminal activity um, and there is an actual um, campaign called no more exclusions where it wants to ban schools from excluding students um, at all and and going to a system of um, no exclusion from school at all but we are seeing this kind of move away from supporting criminals or supporting those who have become criminal the reintegrative shaming to more disintegrative shaming and garland also argues that this crime control system um, is being used by polit politicians as a platform for election, just like you did with the with the um, Potton activity. They're, they're seeing politicians use the phrase being tough on crime in order to actually win elections. But when it comes down to it, they're not actually doing that much to prevent crime. They're just putting in place harsher sentences and, and things like that to deal with the symptoms of crime rather than the causes of crime. So for, for Garland, we've moved away from the reintegrative shaming and the penal welfareism, supporting, rehabilitating and reintegrating 
criminals to a more punitive, disintegrative shaming um, where it's more a culture of control and a culture of uh, using crime as a political tool. Finally, we've got Roosh and Kirchmeier, and I think I'm pronouncing that correct, who come at this from a Marxist perspective. And they argue that punishments have changed when economic needs have changed. So as our um, economic systems have developed, as society has developed economically, we've seen more changes in terms of how we um, punish. And the uh, Rush and Kirchmeier start off their point of looking at the physical punishments. So again, going back to Foucault a little bit in terms of um, public displays of um, punishment and physical punishments, what the what Rush and Kirchmeier said was at a time when um, physical labour was required and um, you needed people to actually do work. So we're talking pre-industrial eras here. You would physically punish people because if they didn't work, they didn't eat, quite simply. So it was a way of um, keeping the workers under control. They then looked at the next stage. They talked about transportation. So in terms of transportation, what we're talking about here is um, late 1800s, um, really, where people would be given a choice. They could either go to prison or they could be sent off to various colonies to farm and um, create industry and create the colonies because these were not nice places to live. There was no infrastructure there. There was no towns. There were no um, water, running water and things like that. So these people would be sent to these places like Australia to create a society. But it was seen as punishment. It's kind of like you go there, you are in a kind of penal colony for four years, but then you can have your farm that you've been working on and that will belong to you. And that helped the economy because whilst you were um, a prisoner, all of your profits or everything you made went back to the state. It was only after your sentencing had ended, your sentence had ended, that you would then um, start keeping your own profits. And today they argue that we've moved to using cheap prison labour. Now, there is an argument and there's a really good um, documentary called The 13th, which looks at this, where when slavery ended, um, they started using mass incarceration and prison labour because they no longer had the slaves to do the work for free. So they used the prisoners. They were uh, they earn well below minimum wage. Um, and that money is then put into their commis commissary, I can't say the word, um, accounts for them to buy things in prison like toothpaste and toothbrushes and stuff like that, cigarettes, um, uh, or they can save it up and have it for when they are released. But there's a lot of prison industries that have popped up where the state is making money from prisoners through their through cheap labour. In the US, it would be things like making number plates. In the UK, furniture um, and things like that. So as society changes, we've moved away from um, slavery, if you like. We've moved, we've, we've created a new type of slavery. Uh, in, the 19, in the early 1900s, you had um, pr chain gangs where prisoners would be taken out to build new roads. Um, they'd be chained together, they'd do litter picking and things like that. So we're, we're talking about very hard labour within uh, for the prisoners um, for very little money. So again, it's people being able to make money 
from prisoner labour because the prisoners aren't making money because this is part of their punishment. OK, so let's talk about prisons, because that is the, the main um, form of punishment that we have in the UK. We, we, we send people to prison when they've committed crime. We incarcerate them. And if we look at the stats for prisons in the UK, so these are the stats for January 2021. Our current prison population stands at 78,000 people, um, not including those who are juveniles and not including those who are waiting deportation. Um, and that puts our prison po population rate at 130 per 100,000 people. It's quite high. Not as high as the US, but it's still quite high. Um, of that 78,000, 15 are on remand. So that means they are currently being held in prison whilst awaiting trial. And what would happen is if they are found guilty, they might they would have time served removed from their sentence. So if they've spent two years in prison and they've got three year sentence, they only need to serve another year because they've already done two. Or if they're um prison sentence is say two years and they've already served 18 months in prison the judge might say you're guilty but i'm giving you time served because you've already done 18 months we'll put you on probation for the last six months okay so that's what we mean by prisoners on remand in terms of occupancy level we are currently over occupancy in prison so, so we're at a rate of 104 percent so we've got more people in prison than we've got space for. And that's led to overcrowding and poor. Um, um, oh, what's the word? Conditions. That's what I was looking for. Poor conditions, um, higher ratios of guard to prisoner um, and funding issues, because in the UK, you don't get funded per prisoner. You get funded. A certain amount of money regardless of how many prisoners you have so at the moment in the uk we are over occupancy and we we would suggest that prisons are a way of of a deterrence or to for rehabilitation and reintegration but in the uk we have a reoffending rate of 75 percent within the first uh, nine years of release within nine years of being released um and a 39% re um, reoffending rate within the first year of being released. But if we look at the trends over time, we are seeing a decline in prison population. Um, not much of a decline, but it is a starting point for decline. Now, the, the trends that I've got on the screen will only, only go up to 2018. Um, with 2020 and 2021, with the COVID, um, situation there have been changes um, and we're going to have that will have to be played into when studying those actual statistics in the fact that courts haven't been in session so people haven't had their cases um, there's been no probation um, hearings because you can't do that so some people maybe who would have been released haven't been yet that doesn't mean they're serving more than their sentence. If they've served their sentence, they need to be released. But people who perhaps are coming towards the end of their sentence and may have got early release for good behaviour or to alleviate some of the overpopulation in um, prisons. Um, so this raises the question of whether or not prisons are actually effective as a form of punishment. So some people say that they are. Because when people go to prison, they have a bad experience whilst in prison and they don't want to go back. And it can reform and re-socialise. There are education programmes, there are rehabilitation programmes, there's drug and alcohol support for those who, are, who have addictions. So th there is processes and programmes within the prison system which try to prevent re-offending, re 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 recidivism of offenders but 
we can see that recidivism perhaps is more likely because of the labelling. We still have re disintegrative shaming in the UK. It's not a case of you're an OK person, but you did something bad. It's you're a criminal. And because you're a criminal, you can't be employed by these, these industries. You can't do this sort of work. Employers don't want to employ you. You, don't, you can't get somewhere to live because landlords don't want an ex-convict as, as a tenant. So that label of I am a, a, a criminal, I've, I've served time in prison, can lead to reoffending because there is no reintegration in society. You have been ostracised by the label of being a criminal. And there's also the argument that prisons are a school of crime. And rather than being re-socialisation into society, you're being re-socialised into criminal activity. So, for example, you might go in as a thief or a pickpocket. Whilst you're in prison, you learn how to be a forger or a con man or something like that and come out with a new set of criminal skills. Um, so they're kind of like schools of crime rather than rehabilitation into the norms and values and criminal, non-criminal behaviour. But whether or not you feel that prisons are effective is up to you to decide. So we've looked at the purposes of punishment. We've looked at the five purposes set forward by Newburn, rehabilitation, restorative justice, protection from society, boundary maintenance and retribution. We've looked at the functionalist, the Marxist and the Weberism um, views of punishment, so the movements, uh, so the um, view of it being positive for society, negative and legal rational. We've looked at how change, punishment has changed over time from sovereign power to disciplinary power, from penal welfareism to punitive state, and how the economy has also changed the punishment systems that we use within society. And finally, we talked about the role of prisons as a form of punishment. So make sure that your um, notes grid is highlighted and checked. Any questions, any queries, let me know and I will answer them.